thank you, Omkar, for the invitation. And uh, always very nice to be here in person again after a while. And uh, so you all had, uh, I'm sure all of you have had like your fill of talks for the day. Uh, you just went through a, a, a long uh, uh, set talks in the morning uh, and so on. I'll I'll try to uh, I'll try to be uh, give a broad overview of uh, uh, some topics. I actually, Shira has covered some of the, the ground in the the first uh, part of my talk, so I don't have to sort of uh, repeat uh, repeat that. Uh, so this is about one aspect of. Uh, uh, of what I was talking about, namely the ABS-CFT correspondence, or uh, what is probably a little broadly, more broadly known as uh, gate string duality. Uh, so, uh, so the plan is that I this is the part that I think I can uh, sort of uh, go very quickly over. Uh, but I'll try to spend some time trying to draw some pictures and trying to explain an approach uh, to understand gate string duality in its nuts and bolts. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, we'll, uh, I'll try to uh, describe uh, a special limit of the ADS safety correspondence where one can try to uh, make a uh, very precise sense of this correspondence. Uh, and uh, in sort of uh, having uh, uh, a way to go from the field theory description to the string theory description and vice versa. So, the, uh, the first thing is uh, what is gate string duality and why it is important. I think for this audience who's probably been uh, had many, many talks on ADS CFT, this is probably not uh, really uh, necessary, but uh, just very quickly. Uh, so, all of you know that quantum field theory and general relativity are the mainstays of uh, 20th century physics. And uh, they are, of course, broad frameworks, and between them, they describe the better part of our universe. Uh, so, quantum field theory, of course, are all the non gravitational forces and a very specific class of quantum field theories, namely the Young Mill stage theories, but also uh, a variety of other complex phenomena in nature and various of these disciplines. Whereas, general relativity, as you know, is a classical thing, but it captures the macrocosmos very well. Uh, and uh, uh, so these are two broad frameworks, and gate string duality sort of through string theory connects these two in a very unexpected way, uh, uh, as you've also probably heard. But okay, string theory is um, an ambitious framework. It, it aims to generalize the quantum field theory framework in a way that uh, captures gravitational interactions at the quantum level as well. Uh, what will be sort of important for us to sort of uh, keep in mind in this talk is that uh, the uh, so the underlying uh, the, the the underlying reason that led to string theory being uh, considered uh, so uh, is so much in uh, as a promising theory of describing gravity is the fact that. Uh, Relativistic closed string contains the graviton as one of its lowest modes of excitation. And you can consider, just like you draw Feynman diagrams, you can uh, consider Feynman diagrams of these closed strings uh, interacting with each other. So you have now, instead of the world lines, uh, that Feynman uh, process uh, to think about quantum field theory in terms of, uh, instead of world lines that you sum over, you sum over world sheets. Uh, these two-dimensional surfaces that, uh, uh, that um, uh, the strings uh, trace out. And uh, you can see the, an interaction of this kind would go over to a world sheet of this kind. More complicated diagrams will have world sheets which have many holes in them of what are and the, what is mathematically called Riemann surfaces. And these are Riemann surfaces of, so to say, higher genus, uh, the ones which have multiple holes on them. So loops in Feynman diagrams are correspond to genus, uh, uh, not correspond to, they, in, in the string framework, they would be replaced by, uh, uh, by Riemann surfaces of higher genus. And the quite remarkable aspect of this observation was that once you, uh, there's a certain set of rules, uh, like 
for the Feynman diagram, certain set of rules uh, governing these amp uh, the amplitudes, and they give uh, a finite consistent dis uh, description of quantum correction uh, uh, to Einstein's equations. And uh, uh, these rules are like Feynman diagrams, a perturbative extension, but now in terms of something called the string coupling, uh, so the, the strength of interaction. Uh, and essentially, you should think of this as something that weights the number of holes of the genus, uh, as I was calling it. So that's the quantum parameter in string theory that's related to the Newton's constant and uh, uh, you know, as with this uh, theory of gravity. So uh, you, you sum over these world sheets. Of course, string, this was the historical origin of string theory, and string theory has gone far beyond it. And uh, in particular, uh, uh, one of its important successes has been to describe not only the perturbative scattering of uh, gravitons and so on, but also of objects like black holes in uh, uh, in, and understanding them at the quantum level. But uh, what is gate string duality? It, it ha, it's a very unexpected equivalence uh, between string theories, uh, namely theories of quantum gravity on a certain class of space times. These, uh, in the simplest case, the antidisciplinar or asymptotically antidisciplinar uh, uh, space times, and quantum field theories that live on the boundary of the conformal boundary, more precisely, of, of the space time. Uh, so this picture is uh, the sort of the standard representation of uh, an antidisciplinar like space time with a time direction and the cross sections which indicate the hyperbolic nature of the space time. Uh, so the spatial cross sections are, if you wish, uh, hyperbolic spaces. And the whole space time has a uh, antidisciplinar space time itself as a constant negative curvature. Uh, but more generally, you would consider space times which are only asymptotically and the disciplinar near the boundary there. Uh, and the disciplinar and the corresponding to the statement of gauge gravity duality is the relation between quantum gravity theories or more precisely string theories on these asymptotically uh, hyperbolic space times and quantum field theories at the class of quantum field theories. Uh, and the conformal field theory, such as the striping as the fixed points uh, of uh, all quantum field theory. So things which are asymptotically conformal field theory in the ultraviolet, in a sense, it, 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 this antidisciplinary space time sort of geometrizes uh, the field theory scale in, in that the boundary of the antidisciplinary space time is a reflection of the ultraviolet of the field theory, whereas Phenomena that happen more inside the antidisciplinar uh, uh, is, is a reflection of things happening at longer length scales in the field theory. In, in any case, there is so this duality that Maldasena proposed 25 years ago, uh, it was very remarkable because it translated questions in quantum field theory to questions in string theory gravity and gave new insight on both sides. I mean, the, 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 there's a dictionary which uh, relates the quantum field theory or the CFP on the z-dimensional boundary and the uh, uh, gravity theory or the string theory on this uh, antidisciplinar space time. And this dictionary it tells you very surprising things on both sides, uh, about both sides. And that's because it is really a duality. It interchanges weakly or uh, a weakly curved ADS, that means curvature, very small curvatures of ADS to a, uh, to a strongly coupled or strongly interacting quantum field theory, and vice versa, a highly curved uh, uh, antidisciplinary space time to a weakly coupled uh, QFD. So uh, you, you can study weakly curved ADS to Einstein's equations, and that tells you about things you don't normally get access to strongly coupled QFDs, but you can in, uh, try to get the insight the other way about studying weakly coupled quantum field theories, which you learn in your uh, courses in quantum field theory, uh, and try to learn about string theories on highly curved and the set of space time. So the, the, there's an information flow both ways, and, it, it, and uh, that's part of the remarkable nature of this uh, uh, correspondence. 
So I, I just want to stress some aspects of this, which uh, probably you have all seen, but uh, it, it's uh, this duality is a statement about the quantum theory. So it's a statement uh, uh, of the quantum equivalences of the Hilbert spaces on both sides of this duality that there are operators in the boundary, the field theory on the boundary, the usual uh, operators that you uh, uh, would consider in a gauge theory, the physical operator in a gauge theory, and they are related to states in the bulk uh, quantum gravity theory. In particular, the dimensions of these operators map to energies of the states in the bulk space time. Uh, that's part of the dictionary. And the dictionary goes on to tell you so the dimensions, if you wish, are captured by two point functions of operators, and they will correspond to the energy that I said. Uh, but you, uh, you can talk about the three point functions, they capture the interactions of the bulk, for instance, the cubic interactions uh, uh, in the bulk of not only gravity, but gravity plus a tower of particles, which comes in a stringy description in general. So, so there is um, a, a dictionary of operators of correlation functions, uh, and um, and of course, uh, what I was saying earlier about the strong weak coupling equivalence it follows from a dictionary of parameters. So, in, for instance, in this most canonical case, the 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 coupling of the field theory, so it's a gauge theory, and it will be in particular what is called the large end gauge theory. Uh, uh, so a gauge theory with a gauge group SUN in which, uh, in which you take uh, the n very large, but scale parameters accordingly to get a sensible limit. And, and that limit is one in which you keep this coupling, which is called the Toft coupling. You keep this finite. Uh, so the in the gauge theory, there are essentially two parameters. There's the, the coupling that measures the strength of interactions. And then there's one over n, which is uh, which was the insight of Toft that you get an extra parameter when you do the large n expansion, and that parameter weights Feynman diagrams differently. There are Feynman diagrams uh, uh, in, of a large n gauge theory can be organized in terms of their genus, and uh, and one over n weights a genus expansion uh, um, in a way which I'll mention later. Uh, so, but at the moment, uh, so there are these two parameters in the uh, field field, and they correspond to two parameters that uh, characterize the antidecitors uh, uh, quantum theory, namely the size of the ADS. The, so that's related to the radius of the ADS. It's related to some power of this coupling. And uh, the Newton's constant of string coupling that I mentioned in, uh, when I talked about the in their world sheets that is related to one over n. So you can see this G string is proportional to one over n, and the radius is just proportional to the power of the lambda. But, but the, the upshot of this is that when the uh, is the statement I made earlier that when the uh, uh, when the coupling is very large, that corresponds to a very weakly curved radius. So the radius is very large, it's the same as the curvature being pretty small. Uh, Whereas the opposite limit, when the coupling is very small and you uh, you have a weakly interacting quantum field theory that corresponds to a, a highly uh, uh, curved AD, uh, ADS because the radius is sort of small in 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 the units, the natural string units, and uh, so and the geometry is also very far from that described by Einstein's equations. Uh, it really requires. Uh, 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 the stringy, uh, it's in some sense, the stringy geometry that replaced the science and its equations. The, this picture, which I'll come back to, is sort of labeling those two axes. So you can see on this side is one over n or g Newton, that's the g string. Uh, uh, so that's the sort of quantum regime of the gravity theory, because that's what the Newton's constant. Uh, measures uh, from the gravity point of view. It's this one over n uh, parameter of thought from the field theory point of view. Whereas the horizontal axis is this uh, is basically the the coupling constant and uh, uh, and the radius. So this is sort of when they equals to zero, and this is equal to infinity. 
uh, um, uh, so uh, so this is some power of the radius uh, this, this one to do uh, 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 indicate that but typically uh, so these were the two corners that I sort of referred to here uh, and we usually work in the uh, uh, we, we, we can choose to specialize further in by considering classical uh, and the classical string geometry which is what we will do for most of this talk. So, okay, so maybe you've heard a lot of uh, this before, but um, uh, I just want to say, why do people make such a big deal of previous CFD? So from the, the GR point of view, uh, uh, from the general point of view, it gives a concrete model for what a, uh, a quantum, in the theory of quantum gravity should look like. So we, we hardly have any concrete descriptions of, uh, and we would like to, of course, finally describe quantum gravity in our universe, uh, which is in some sense the visitor-like universe. But, but it, uh, this is a major uh, foothold that you get in knowing what should be characters of, uh, uh, or uh, characteristics of a, a theory of quantum gravity. So at least in this uh, large class of space times, um, you have this, and it realizes certain ideas that people had more nebulously sort of uh, uh, proposed, and namely famously Tov and Saska, and um, this idea of philosophy that somehow a theory of quantum gravity has fewer degrees of freedom, and that's realized here because, in some sense, you're saying you get a complete description of a B plus one dimensional theory in terms of a B dimensional theory. And uh, so the microscopic degrees of freedom of this theory of quantum gravity are really in some ways encoded in sort of a, in a screen uh, in the boundary. And uh, this is what you heard in the morning about how is that bulk encoded? Uh, and that's where the ideas of quantum information and so on uh, uh, have been playing a role. Uh, people here have been uh, 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 trying to figure that uh, a dictionary of how this encoding takes place, and that's one of the remarkable aspects of this. From the quantum field theory side, also, it's a very remarkable thing because it gives a completely unsuspected dual description of strongly interacting case theories in terms of a very classical description solving uh, classical PDEs uh, to learn about a highly quantum regime. For me personally, actually, a motivation which has been very strong is that it realizes a very old idea, which in some ways goes back to Faraday and Maxwell about the gauge theories like electrodynamics, the flux lines are, are really strings in some sense. And actually, if you go back uh, to Maxwell, I was looking, uh, Maxwell spent six years, I think, till he arrived at Maxwell's equations. So he, first was, he, he was trying to make Faraday's ideas precise, and he started formulating things in terms of Faraday's lines of flux, and he modeled them as vortices, as sort of cubes. They had a mechanical model for these uh, things that sort of what what takes these, and then you know, try to describe their dynamics, but failed, and uh, uh, and of course then arrived at the insight that a local description in terms of electric and magnetic fields is is the one that more amenable. But in some sense, this is an old idea and has uh, has reappeared, and in, and we believe that the large and expansion in some sense provides the natural home for this idea. Uh, so any case, so that's, I think, uh, for me, a very, uh, 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 a reason to believe that this is a very universal thing. And sometimes I give this talk, um, a more general public talk called why strings. I mean, I think that it's not, I think strings are very natural objects in nature. They're not just some, oh, someone woke up and said, oh, we want to generalize from a point particle to one dimensional object. No, I think it arises very naturally. And I think you, every time you place a magnet and see the lines of force, in some sense, you're seeing a rudimentary and reflection of a string. Uh, but of course, that I think that idea needs to be made more precise. And this is a context where it can be. Uh, any case, so that's one motivation. And finally, there are no mathematicians in the audience, but uh, if there were, then I would say that there's 
very comparable to sort of one of the major uh, efforts in contemporary mathematics, so-called Langlands correspondence in sort of two different universes getting very non-trivially uh, mapped to each other. Makes me want to read about the Langlands correspondence. <laughs> So, ADS-CFP has had a major impact in many areas of theoretical physics, not only in string theory. And again, just uh, to list a few applications, in some ways it touches on all the topics and, uh, that were covered today morning. In high energy physics, it's been inspirational in setting up scenarios like the Randall syndrome one. We've learned about the scattering amplitudes in the strong coupling regime uh, through the uh, BES and so on, uh, about QCD itself through various better ways to model QCD uh, and, and uh, get sort of a effective field theory description which preserves the symmetries of QCD by. Um, and uh, and then of course uh, is thermal QCD, uh, the quark gluon plasma phase, and learning about its properties and the fluid gravity uh, correspondence that uh, has been developed here. Uh, similarly, in cosmology, we, this is being the ADSCF viewers uh, behind the first construction of. Uh, scenarios in string theory, which realize this is a space time and again uh, pioneered uh, here uh, in, in uh, the IFR. Uh, and uh, similarly, quantum in uh, uh, condensed matter physics and uh, uh, quantum information. Uh, so, again, you heard about some of these things uh, today morning uh, also from Shiraz. Um, so, so this it, it, just to give a sense of how it has had in 25 years a lot of impact in the thinking in other uh, allied disciplines of theoretical physics. Okay, so that was sort of the introduction, and now I want to try to uh, uh, try to get to the the central point of uh, my talk, which is uh, the question. Uh, that in a way was uh, probably uh, raised by Toft first, but how exactly do large and quantum field theories reorganize themselves into theories of things? And uh, the, the duality that Malasena proposed didn't come out of thin air, it came out of an understanding of objects in string theory called new brains, which are objects that involve uh, so-called open strings. So when I drew those Feynman diagrams, I drew closed strings, which sort of create some of these tubes. But uh, the simplest string theories, in some sense, are open string theories, which are like uh, a piece of string with two endpoints, and those will trace out objects in space-time. Uh, when you uh, and their world sheets are have boundaries, they have this boundary here, this boundary here, because the endpoints that are the endpoints of the string, and they trace out in time uh, a world sheet. And uh, these strings also can interact uh, with each other. And indeed, the lightest excitations of these strings are Yangman fields. Uh, and uh, uh, so, the, uh, in string theory, the equivalence of these two was proposed by Malasena as being forced on one by the consistency of string theory. And that the open and closed string descriptions are sort of they're, they're, you can't separate them in some sense. Uh, they are uh, uh, there's uh, it's uh, you can think of, for instance, this you I might think of as a closed string world sheet, but actually I can also think of this as an open string world sheet, which is going around in a loop. You can think of these the endpoints of the open split to one of the endpoints of the open string going around in a loop. And the whole string therefore goes around and forms the same cylinder. So, in some sense, the open and closed descriptions are very intimately tied to each other. And um, the Toft, uh, Toft are a mnemonic for understanding loud and gauge theory. And very, very sort of recently, he had described the Feynman diagrams of loud and gauge theories 
uh, in terms of strips. Into, uh, and basically that was because gauge fields uh, and in, in an SUN theory are matrices, but carry two indices, uh, I and J. So he, he had the idea to represent uh, the gauge fields as uh, uh, with these two indices as sort of double lines, the gauge field propagators, the, uh, the way they enter uh, in these as double lines, because he also had quarks that have single indices, and those would be things that would have just a single boundary. Uh, but um, uh, so, so uh, in fact, his way of organizing Feynman diagrams uh, uh, in terms of their genus arose from uh, this picture of thinking of the Feynman diagrams as built from these strips that kind of triangulate a surface. Uh, I don't have the time to explain that, but uh, in detail, uh, but perhaps many of you have seen that. Uh, uh, the description is something now used, the laws and expansionists use in condensed matter physics and high energy physics and so on. Uh, and, and so uh, the, um, the uh, so these larger gauge theory Feynman diagrams, the open string diagrams, which uh, which in so the, the miracle of Maldacena's duality is that in some sense, these holes that are there in an open string diagram. So an open string diagram has boundaries. So a general open string diagram would have the multiple boundaries uh, and there would be uh, insertions of the operators, your scattering. Uh, and uh, the, the, somehow the miracle of uh, ADS safety can be encapsulated in this cartoon that uh, in some sense, the field theory diagrams here, uh, the, or the, uh, the string theory diagrams that give rise to the field theory, uh, they can be viewed as, uh, as uh, surfaces with poles. And in some sense, as you sort of sum over all these surfaces, when you uh, write the Feynman diagram expansion, sum over all the Feynman diagrams, effectively they kind of close up and you get something which is a purely closed string diagram, namely a diagram without any boundaries. Uh, um, uh, uh, so this is, so Mandasena arrived at this um, in a strong coupling limit, in a, in a limit where he could also view these deep grains as uh, creating a certain geometry. Uh, and uh, so, and in that limit, this is very difficult to see how uh, it's, it's difficult to see explicitly how this works. It arises, you know, from the consistency of string theory that this must be true, and this is how we learned everything that we have about ADS CFD. But it's not something that you can very explicitly uh, kind of uh, trace through uh, and understand why this happens. So, uh, so what I have, uh, so what I feel is that we. It's been 25 years, and we need to understand to be able to take ads CFD further. And I think understand not just specific examples. Uh, we need to sort of derive it in some sense to understand what are the sort of the cogs and the wheels that make this uh, duality tick. Uh, so, and it's not from some mathematical fastidiousness. It's, I think, a physical necessity because these are, otherwise we are sort of in a particular corner so that we understand and we haven't, we, we haven't yet been able to, uh, we haven't been able to go very much beyond that. Uh, for instance, the, the, in this landscape of parameters, the stringy ADS CFT that is going, be, so, uh, okay, so I should back up a little. Einstein's gravity is this corner of this parameter space because it's the place where the radius is very large or equivalently the coupling is very large and you consider the classical limit, so uh, you neglect quantum effects. So effectively you're in this corner of the parameter space and you can consider corrections to Einstein's equation in a inverse power expansion in, in the coupling. Uh, but you, so you, you explore some region here, uh, but even sticking to the classical limit, namely uh, there's still a whole range 
uh, of this so called stringy ABS CFP, where the couplings are of order one in the field theory, uh, even, even while keeping the string semi classical uh, in the large n limit. So, this is a whole region which we haven't, uh, we still don't have uh, tools to get our hands on very well. And uh, this is the regime where uh, in some of the maybe a string description of something like QCD or some strongly attracting uh, um, uh, condensed matter systems are likely to be uh, in this regime. There is no particular reason why they should be in the extremely strong coupling regime. Uh, so to learn how and when do quantum field theories reassemble themselves into string theories or in what way are string-like excitations arising like Maxwell or Faraday uh, wanted uh, out of gauge theory, I think is, it's a very important imperative. And, and you need a sort of a first principles way of going beyond the examples that we have, which uh, we arrived at thanks to our understanding of uh, various uh, aspects of deep brains. So in another reason is to sort of this idea of this holography, this screen to, and this reconstruction, which I think uh, definitely the ideas from quantum information will play a role. But to, I think to be able to understand how those degrees of freedom in the, in the, in the boundary uh, are getting assembled, I think will tell us more about the holography, this idea of this region, region uh, reconstruction that was mentioned also today morning about how a region of the boundary, how, how does it create a region of the bulb? And, and then, of course, this is still at the classical level. You can ask how a quantum space time would then emerge from all this. So that's sort of the motivation for what I'm to say. So this is the picture that I uh, sort of uh, drew over here. As I said, most of the work in some sense has been under this lamppost. Um, and it's been, of course, remarkable. And we've learned completely amazing things about ultra strongly coupled quantum field theories uh, from this classical gravity. I mean, who would have thought that we could say something even remotely making sense about the quad gluon plasma <laughs> just from uh, uh, solving Einstein's equation. So uh, it's, um, uh, it's definitely, of course, uh, we've learned a lot, but that I think should tell us that there's a lot more that we can learn. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, as with this, you, there's a reason you work on the lampposts because that's where you have a sound um, uh, footing on which to base uh, your film. But there is another lamppost that uh, we all are exposed to as the uh, graduate students at Name Peters, whatever old fashioned Pascal and Schroeder. Uh, whatever quantum field theory, uh, and uh, and uh, that is something we think we understand, and uh, uh, and that's supposed to be equivalent to a very highly curved, a very stringy regime of ads CFT. And this was in fact first emphasized by Sundborg uh, many years ago, in the in almost uh, night and uh, almost uh, right after the ads CFT. Uh, but it has not been, I think, adequately. Uh, um, uh, examine. Uh, so, so let me uh, say a little more technically what I think would uh, satisfy me as uh, uh, as a sort of a derivation, at least a first step towards a derivation. Uh, I'll take a sort of an operational definition, uh, which is uh, which involves the ads CFD correspondence. So I'll. Uh, so the left hand side is a gauge theory, field theory quantity, and I'll explain a little. The right hand side is a stringy quantity. Uh, so what is the left hand side? That's probably easier for people to understand. These are operators of the gauge theory. They will be gauge invariant operators, as in, a, uh, in any gauge theory. Uh, uh, and we'll stick to Euclidean signature for simplicity, though that's not. Uh, um, and there are various labels, you can ignore them, they're just labels indexing the different kinds of operators that can be there in the theory. And uh, we consider what are called single trace operators because uh, those are the gauge invariant or simplest 
class of gauge invariant operators you can build, which are built from the polynomials in the fields. Uh, um, you, as I said, uh, these and the gauge field, the field strengths you construct from them are uh, polynomials. Uh, you can make polynomials out of them and take a trace of this big matrix. You can take multiply many of these and take a trace. A thing of trace, in some sense, has been understood uh, uh, is uh, what corresponds to a single particle state in the bulk. Uh, and certainly we are in this weak coupling regime, so it makes sense to talk in the bulk of the single particle states. And so these are the operators that correspond to single particle states in the bulk string theory. And so the claim is that if you compute a correlator, which you can do in, say, perturbative quantum field theory using uh, all the contractions and all the usual rules, you can uh, compute this correlator. You can organize it as Toft dead by genus, and you pick out the genus G part of it. And the, uh, uh, for instance, take the genus zero part, but you can compute uh, these. So there's a whole list of these quantities. Uh, for every value of the positions of x1 to xn are positions on the boundary of the antidecitor space-time in Euclidean signature, that's a sphere, but in uh, <laughs> Lorentz in signature, it would be this uh, cylinder. In, in any case, you compute the correlators on that as a function of position as a function of all these other uh, extra labels that they have, and you want to match it to something on the gravity side. And the gravity side, the dictionary broadly tells you that it must be a stringy amplitude. And as I said, there are prescriptions uh, from the early days of string theory. We've learned how, what, how to compute a stringy amplitude, the stringy analog of a Feynman diagram. It's a sum over world sheets. Uh, so you have to sum over all possible world sheets of uh, scattering amplitude of string states. And string states are created, if you wish, uh, uh, scattering amplitude is created by inserting, uh, uh, by letting these, uh, uh, these external string states go back in time, or creating effectively like an infinite cylinder, which uh, you can think of as, a, uh, as equivalent to inserting a puncture on a, uh, on a surface, because it's um, uh, the mathematics of the formal invariance of the surface, the infinite cylinder is equivalent to a puncture. So you can think of um, the scattering amplitude on this side as a, a quantity in which you have a world sheet which has genus G, the same genus that uh, um, would uh, uh, assign to the Feynman diagrams. And then you have some scattering amplitude. So you should think of these as sort of effectively equivalent to inserting infinite external uh, uh, cylinders, uh, but it's mathematically easier to deal with them as punctures um, uh, on, in, uh, on the surface. So, that's, so you, are, you are considering a Riemann surface uh, of G and G and so say with N punctures, that's what the symbol here represents. And these are, uh, quantities that you assign uh, so that the, you need a dictionary, firstly, between the states. As I said, there's a dictionary, ADSFT tells you a dictionary between operators and states in the bulk. And there's uh, each state uh, in string theory, uh, uh, when you just consider the scattering amplitude of states that are created by a uh, certain set of operators in the, uh, in the world sheet uh, theory, uh, um, that uh, are labeled, of course, by the labels of the uh, operator here. But in addition, uh, you also label them by the locations at which uh, these um, world sheets are, uh, at which these um, operators are inserted, and then you sum over them. You should think, if you're not familiar with this, you should just think of this as, uh, uh, as a generalization of a formalism, which is not really taught in perturbative quantum field theory books, but I think should be, which is the world line formalism in which you can think of the world uh, uh, ordinary Feynman diagrams that you draw as coming from particles inserted, uh, inserted at specific times on a world line. 
And then you integrate over all the possible times because Feynman instructed us that you sum over all possible amplitude. And similarly here, you insert it now, you don't have specific times, the word line has become a word sheet. So you have specific positions, we bed one, bed n are positions, and then you integrate over the space of all these positions and the shapes so that the uh, or the, uh, that the uh, world sheet can take. And that is what is this integral. It's uh, technically called the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G and N functions. It's a well-defined mathematical object. And that uh, integral you do to capture the sum over all possible world sheets. So that, so you want to be able to derive. So, so ADS CFT effectively tells you that there's some equivalence like this. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, Rajesh. Yes, yes. Excuse me for interrupting. So you would say just take, for example, pure blue QCD. Yes. In, in the large end limb, uh, the left hand side is well defined, and uh, genus by genus converting, there should be a string word sheet. Is this that term? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so this. Okay, I, I I didn't specify what these sort of. This is a correlator uh, of the uh, of the on that world sheet theory. Uh, and so there's a world sheet description, just like when you write down the world line description, you have a world line Hamiltonian. Similarly, on the world sheet, you have a world sheet theory, and this is a sort of a correlator in that two-dimensional world sheet theory, which is related to this uh, correlate. So this would be some non-SUSI. In general, it would be some non-SUSI something. You would expect that there should be some uh, theory like uh, And uh, uh, we, of course, know the most in some SUSI examples, but presumably it's more general. Uh, and so what I just want to emphasize is that the left-hand side is, firstly, these two are autonomously well-defined quantities. They have very different the definitions, the left hand side, very generally, even away from any perturbative limit, you can define in terms of some quantum field theory uh, fixed point. And uh, in the right hand side is also presumably well defined in terms of some world sheet theory. Uh, there would be, I, I think, a fairly well defined world sheet. Uh, there should be a world sheet two dimensional description. Uh, for um, uh, for most of the string theories that would for the string theories that would be dual to gauge theories. So if that is the case, then this equivalence is a mathematically precise or well posed question. Uh, and um, and the the statement is: Can we make this equality manifest? That it's not just that you compute this using your techniques. You compute this using you know, some other techniques ah, and you see, oh, wow, they match. Uh, great. That's great. I think that's, but that should be the first step. Now, the first step in your understanding is making sure they match. Uh, the second step should be to understand why they match and whether there's a way to see that that matching is not some miracle or some magic. Uh, it's just follows from certain, because you're, in a sense, doing the same things on both sides. You, you're, and that's typically the way in which you would expect an infinite set of quantities like this to match. It's because you're doing the same things just in a re, a reshuffled way, in some more uh, complicated way you're uh, doing. And so, and so the question is, can you topologize the correspondence? Right. Like, simple, and there are the Ramon-Ramon process is not straightforward. It's not necessarily straightforward. We don't know in many cases, indeed. But I'm, I'm going on the presumption that there will be one. We haven't, humanity hasn't discovered that yet in, a, in the best possible way, but uh, that there should be one. Uh, N equal to four uh, super animals. And I believe it should, yeah, N equal to four. And you might ask the even more stronger question whether ordinary young mills would admit such a description, which I would like to say optimistically, yes, but I don't have very strong evidence for it, but uh, or any evidence really for it. But, Sorry? When N equals four, 
What, what do you well, I, I mean, firstly, there are descriptions by Berkowitz and others which have had some success. So I think, in principle, there are some descriptions which seem to capture the, the scene. Uh, I think recently, while studying the tensionless limit, we 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 find a set of world sheet prescriptions that would give rise to the spectrum of Yangel's theory. Uh, now. Putting that that set of prescriptions on a footing where you can derive it from the usual rules of world sheet uh, that the world sheet CFT should obey, that's still not yet done. But uh, yeah, so uh, I I feel okay. Uh, that's maybe a digression, but I I I, I feel yes we. Uh, people have tried to describe antidecitor space in terms of Ramon Ramon fluxes, just using our old sigma model approach. That uh, we think that yeah, but I think the sigma model approach is not the best approach to describe it. I mean, we think of sigma model. That's also in some sense a very classical approach. You have some target space, and then you sort of uh, you write down the simplest two-dimensional field theory on it. It may be at best, I think, an effective field theory of the world sheet. I, there should be, I feel, and, and that's where I think the space space of world sheet theories is not something we have explored very much. We have stuck to, again, a narrow corner, which is of uh, sigma models, perturbative sigma models. And those, yes, you can solve them. Maybe you can use integrability for some more. You can do certain things with it, but, but I think that there are vast. And in the case of ADS-3, even without Ramon Ramon flux, we know that in a that specific case of uh, the tensionless limit, the natural description is not in terms of a sigma model. It's in terms of certain twister variables, which give right to a free field description of the... And, I, and even what we propose for the Yang-Mills, any good for Yang-Mills is in terms of certain twister-like fields. So, yeah, I think we are limited by our imagination. So, uh, so as I said, so that's what we're, we would like to be, an, uh, be an, as an operational definition to demonstrate the, or tautologize the quality of things like this. And the best place I feel where we have a hope of doing this is in the uh, in the weak coupling regime of the uh, left hand side of the field theory, and then try to reconstruct the right hand side because the left hand side, as I said, it's Standard field theory stuff in some sense should be able to uh, understand it. And on the right hand side, while it may be unfamiliar for some of the reasons that, uh, but it's still a classical string theory, should be describable by some string like object and its description of its motion in, uh, in, in something which has at least the ADS symmetries. And, uh, now, oh, sorry, sorry, I know you have a flight to catch it, but yeah. uh, to go back to what you said at the beginning, uh, could we directly try now that we have so much motivation, go back to Faraday and Maxwell and say, let's rewrite uh, the gauge series in terms of Wilson lines, which are the natural gauge invariant objects and give by switch frames? Yeah, and so that also pulled up pride, right, and uh, people tried those things. Yeah. Again, I think. They were trying looking at macroscopic loops. Macroscopic loops are not necessary, are messy to deal with. The loop equations, as some people here have studied, are very messy equations. Uh, I don't think they may, in principle, uh, capture the information, but very difficult to do anything with them. These are much easier in some sense, and that's where, because we are considering certain sort of S matrices of the string theory, uh, and which are given in terms of local quantities on a two-dimensional theory, which I think would be easier. Um, and then I think once you have that, I mean, you can talk about the Wilson line observables and so on as, uh, as uh, sort of further quantities. But to just understand the dynamics, I think this is, it's easier to deal with this. That's my personal prejudice. There's a reason also this lambda goes to zero limit is very interesting from the mm -hmm. uh, string theory side in that there have been proposals from 
from even starting from flat space that that there is that this site, which is where the radius is very small, as I said, it, it, you can think of the radius, as I said, is in units of the string unit. So there's a tension of the string, and you can, uh, and this is the dimension less quantity. Uh, so then this quantity goes to zero. You can think of it either as the radius going to zero in string units, or equivalently keeping the radius fixed and the tension going to zero. Uh, uh, so this tensionless limit or high energy limit of string theory, uh, people have often viewed this as having some extra symmetries, uh, that it's a sort of an analog of gauge theories in the unhixed phase. So in the standard model, we see the gauge theory in the Higgs phase, and that's why it took us a long time to decipher the electronic uh, uh, theory, because it's not like Yang Mills theory where there's a photon. I mean, you uh, want uh, Maxwell theory with a photon. Uh, you don't see the underlying degrees of freedom very easily because they are in the Higgs phase. Whereas this lambda goes to zero is a place where I think you can see the essentials of string theory without, in some sense, it's a lot of obscuring features. Uh, and it involves a much higher, uh, bigger symmetry. And this idea was proposed in, in the context of a flat space in a very heuristic way. Actually, it's much more precise in anti-dissiter space times because there, the free theory itself, that the starting point, has a lot of additional conserved currents and therefore symmetry. And the dual string theory has the uh, highest in, so to say, massless, highest in uh, gauge fields. So you do believe that this must be the sort of, uh, uh, this, this must be a field that should be the nice point to expand around. Uh, and it, in some ways, there are speculations even at those times that there's maybe a topological phase. I mean, because we normally think of gravity also that the metric, one of the things, which is different uh, in some ways along the lines of the Higgsing is that the metric is non-zero. Uh, we all live in a space time in which the metric has a Minkowski or asymptotically Minkowski or this or whatever uh, the same. But if you think about it as a field, that's a, in some sense something where you have an expectation value. It's, uh, it's you would have thought the metric being zero would be where. Uh, there would be a topological phase or a, 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 an unhixed phase, which would manifest the maximum amount of symmetry. So that the uh, uh, that is true. this is probably uh, precise only for three D gravity, where I can really think of metric as it. That's where people have maybe made it more precise. I have a feeling that that whole discussion is a little vague, and it's probably. Uh, Effectively, it is like G menu. I think G menu is a kind of a composite object, yeah. and it's like a composite operator, psi bar psi, having a wet. I mean, it's uh, uh, so you, uh, it, it, I mean, the Chen Simons case, 3D gravity was a case where you could kind of make it work, so to say, but uh, see what, what it meant. But uh, I think more generally, it will be, you'll write it in terms of some other fields. Uh, graviton effectively is like a composite of the boundary fields, uh, like it's the stress tensor built out of the stress tensor and that. Uh, uh, so, it will, so I think you won't see the, so, uh, yeah, it won't be in the, 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 the right variables for the quantum description, I think we don't have uh, uh, to describe that case. And that's what I think understanding the tensionless limit will tell you the, the right variables to describe the uh, and the, the theory. That, that is probably a big question. When, yeah. when we work with the heat spin of a gauge theory, like you know, W bosons, then you compute S matrices from the W bosons and you see that uh, um, at high energies, um, the transverse modes behave well, but the longitudinal modes behave very strongly. And does right. that happen for the, uh, does that happen in the high energy limit for these higher oscillator string states? Just flat space. In flat space, uh, no good question. Um, uh, uh, so the um, the, the transverse more uh, modes the, are, the, the transverse modes are the normal modes, but then would be longitudinal modes are the ones that uh, um, 
I was thinking of it, if you're thinking of the higher higher this yeah. is coming as a result of exit somehow. Right. You see right. Like yeah, I, I don't know of anything directly along those lines, any calculation along those lines. In anticipator space time, people have tried to uh, uh, describe what might be responsible for hitting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a classical Higgs mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, a quantum Higgs mechanism. It's like a dynamical symmetry breaking in some sense, because you turn on uh, the... Uh, so you 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 give a wave to some charge fields that are charged under so in uh, like in Yangmill's theory, what is it that gives an anomalous dimension to the spin four current? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that, that will come with some uh, uh, yeah some uh, some in the loop there'll be some uh, thing running which will so it it may be that. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I have the answer. <laughs> Try to do this for the serial. That's uh, right. If there is a what, in one upon n, and yeah. Uh, loop, but I think that is uh, exactly, but yeah. I don't think it, 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 because you need something in a way which is outside Vassilia also. Mm -hmm. You need fields which are charged under the Vassilia. You need additional fields charged, I think. And uh, that's why I think. Um, not Sanyorki, uh, uh, the uh, not Bianchi, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, 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 yeah, uh, Poraki. <laughs> uh, I think he had uh, the uh, this so called mechanism of uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, in Yang Mills, they were looking at, I think, what would. Uh, they have this sort of grand uh, Higgs, actually, huh? Grand buffet. The grand buffet. And, uh, but I think they need, needed the other young mills fields, uh, not just in the higher spin sector. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so, in any case, uh, there, there's some motivation that this may definitely be, and it's definitely a symmetry enhanced point. And so, it's always a good idea to work with the symmetry. Unless you think that perturbative Yang Mills is just boring Peskin and Schroeder stuff that you uh, done and dusted with. Uh, uh, seen many mysteries in recent years that people have uncovered unusual structures, even in perturbative Yang Mills theories, all these geometric structures, just even the mathematical structures and Feynman diagrams and integrability uh, that was discovered for Yang Mills theory. So it started perturbatively, right? I mean, so, uh, and the uh, existence of things like dual conformance. So that's, I think, a lot of stuff even in perturbatively. Okay, so by mathematical structure, you mean what do you mean? Yeah, that, 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 that somehow the, the individual Feynman diagrams are not just some integrals, they mean something. And I think uh, you can ask, Different Feynman diagrams have uh, uh, there are all these periods and uh, they have a geometric meaning and so on. Yeah, I don't know if that would really have a direct relevance to this. I, I'm just trying to point out that even perturbative Yang Mills has many structures that we st still discovering, but it's not uh, uh, that it's not uh, it's not trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, okay, so the basic idea, and I'll try to, uh, the basic idea uh, uh, here uh, in, an, in sort of an approach I've been advocating is to, how, as I said, we come back to this idea of trying to make this equality manifest. So one way to make it manifest is, uh, so um, is to, of course, you want to show that this this side is some in this lambda goes to zero limit. It's a sum over distinct world line topologies. That's just a fancy way of saying sum over different Feynman diagrams of different topologies. Uh, 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 so you so the sum over these you want it to be somehow a sum over these world sheets, uh, this integral. So it, implicitly there is a sum on this side as well. Uh, even though I've not written it, but there's a sum of all the world line diagrams and the world line integrals over the proper time and so on. And this side, and, and you want that to be the same as somehow this right hand side. Uh, in some ways, after gluing up all these diagrams of, the, of, of, of this large end matrix theory. Uh, but 
I want to make a, a stronger statement that, in fact, each Feynman graph corresponds to a single worksheet. So the sum is the same sum, and, and you want to show that each comment, each term in the sum is the same as a, a term in the string in the uh, so so there's a sum of all these diagrams, of one line, these things, and sum over world sheets. The most natural way, and I claim that's the way it occurs, and the natural way for these two objects to be the same is for each term, in some sense, to be term by term the same, and in some ways tautologize that uh, uh, correspondence. So, so that uh, involves a certain canonical way to implement, to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between Feynman graphs and world sheets. Uh, uh, Feynman graphs of this soft kind, the ones with the ribbon graphs of these, uh, yeah, they're sometimes called ribbon graphs because of these double lines. So, uh, and so for instance, uh, I might draw a three-point function. Uh, a three-point function now. Uh, um, uh, uh, this would be a thought diagram for a three point function which involves some gauge fields exchange uh, uh, between them. So these are you can think of these as these important terms. So, uh, so I want to claim that there's a there's a canonical way to associate to this Feynman diagram a corresponding flow string, and that sort of this is what I've tried to picture. Over here, you should think of these three strips as these three strips here, uh, uh, and they're glued together in a in a very canonical, mathematically precise way, uh, which uses a certain parameterization of the state of Riemann surfaces. So, in some ways, it's a refinement of Toft's idea. Toft associated a genus, so he said that oh, this whole class of Feynman diagrams which have this genus is corresponds to the string theory, but I want to sort of say break that down more in a refined way. Say that each term in this Feynman diagram is associated to a Riemann surface, and the sum over all the topologies is the sum over all the Riemann surfaces. Um, yeah. Both sum over one diagrams of the same genus became the sum over the world sheet metric. It is different ways of joining the world system. Yeah. And so your scheme in the single Feynman diagram, which has a meaning, right. that corresponds to a particular world sheet metric? Yes. Yeah. So each, you can think of each point in the modelized space as corresponding to some metric, and because right. that's the remnant of the sum over metrics, right? Uh, you after the gauge equivalence, you're left with uh, 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 so, uh, the different uh, classes of inequivalent metrics. So each world sheet on that modelized space corresponds to some inequivalent metric. And in fact, there is a way, I think, uh, to which we see indications of, of what that metric is. I can even try to, there's something which we call the Strebel gauge in which this metric uh, uh, appears. It's a it's a metric which has locally it's locally flat except for certain delta function singularities at the insertions and at the vertices where the things jump. In a way, it's similar to in the yeah. triangulations of the thing that there are at the vertices there are delta functions. So this is a certain realization of that, but now very generally. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I just want to yeah should. Uh, uh, um, and so, so I just wanted to show you some pictures and uh, sort of skip most of the technicalities uh, of how this gluing happens a little bit. Um, uh, so I showed you here sort of a simple case, so some three-point function uh, gluing, but uh, it's, it's actually much more intricate in general. Um, uh, so here I try to draw a four-point function. So there are three points, Z1, Z2, Z3 here, and there's which you can think of Z4 at infinity. Uh, so all these lines end up on the sphere going to infinity, and they're all meeting at infinity. So think of this as a four-point, these as ribbon graphs of soft graphs of some 
four-point correlator of operators in the field theory that are inserted at some points and infinity. And uh, the, this is one particular weak contraction of those free uh, of the free theory. So and, and there can be multiple weak contractions between vertices. You can see so those are the ones that are color shaded in different. Uh, see, so Z1 to Z4 are all these blue ones, and Z2 to Z4 are all these ones, uh, and Z1, Z2 are these. So these are all the multiple with contractions. I want you to visualize all of these as firstly, uh, yeah, uh, uh, so visualize uh, firstly all the multiple strips uh, being glued together uh, to, to sort of. Uh, in a way which is sort of proportional to the number of uh, weight contractions. Uh, and uh, so I want you to think of these strips, glue them together to form this sort of, uh, in this case, this all these strips, you glue together and form this uh, quadrilateral, you glue all these strips and form uh, this blue one. And so that's same color coding, this yellow one is here. And, uh, and you should think of these strips as infinite strips like this. So they are going from one vertex operator to the other vertex operator. Uh, as I said, you, you can replace them by points, but in fact, really they are infinite cylinders. They're just strips. Uh, so the length is in some sense infinite, uh, if you wish. Um, uh, but, and so these are... Um, uh, so the uh, so the the they are the, like four, so there's a four point function of built out of cylinders which are then kind of gluing themselves up to form a Riemann surface and, and it forms a certain very specific surface uh, which is labeled by the lengths of these uh, so uh, so. This, the Riemann surface associated to this diagram, uh, is one that will be labeled by lengths that are associated to these the transverse distances. So, if you wish, if you you can see that there's a sort of uh, I've, draw, I've drawn a, uh, 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 I've drawn these sort of points in the middle, which are kind of like the null points, if you wish. Those, those will turn out to be zeros of a, uh, of a particular quadratic differential. And these will turn out, the Zs will turn out to be poles, and these will turn out to be zeros. And uh, you should think of these uh, lengths between the zeros as parameterizing the surface. So this picture has a, it's, a, it's something, it's, it's reasonably well known to mathematicians. It's a, and I think it's a very beautiful mathematical picture of uh, parameterization of Riemann surfaces. And it relies on the existence of so-called uh, certain set of unique treble, uh, unique differentials called treble differentials, which, uh, uh, which are, uh, so, uh, which are sort of quadratic differentials, namely they, uh, they transform as phi dz squared. Uh, uh, under a, a coordinate transformation, and there are zeros, and they have double poles. And that, so, if I specify a Riemann surface and some poles, there's a unique Strabel differential with double poles at those points, and the, it'll have some number of zeros. Uh, and moreover, these lengths between the zeros will be real positive numbers. And um, I don't have the time to explain this um, in very much more detail, uh, and it would be a uh, full lecture, but you sort of have level curves, and that's what I tried to draw here. These are sort of level curves of that differential, which are essentially like the world sheets, essentially. You can see, you can think of these, this as a cylinder, and these as level curves on the cylinder, and the cylinders are all meeting, they are interacting at these, them. They're sort of joining at these points and it's forming a close string uh, uh, surface. So, uh, it's mostly like electrostatic stuff. Yeah, exactly. The yeah. First, first guys are the lines of force and these are like equal potential. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the dual. And, and in fact, this is where the 
So you, you, the Feynman graph is associated with the uh, with the uh, with this, and there's a dual Feynman graph, which is actually the one that is associated with these sort of level curves, and they are what I call horizontal and vertical trajectories of this uh, thing. So there is. Uh, indeed, and this is behind in my seminar, the whole duality between graphs and the dual graphs and so on. Anyhow, um, but uh, what I wanted to basically uh, getting out of this, oops, uh, and I should probably now um, more or less stop, but uh, what I just want to emphasize is that there's a very um, concrete way in which you can connect uh, uh, connect Riemann surfaces with uh, uh, with the world lines, and um, I don't have the time to describe it in detail. But in in a in some very specific cases, you actually can see this realized in the tensionless limit of one of the simplest ADS CFT examples, namely ADS three and CFT two. You you actually can realize uh, this. Because you see, there's a you can look at the kind of correlator of the field theory. Uh, it's given in this sort of uh, the, the, it's a correlator of what's called the symmetric orbital CFD, and there are these are so-called twist operators. And there was a very beautiful picture of Lunin Mathur who gave a way to compute these correlators by going to a covering space. It was sort of a nice mathematical trick for covering it, but uh, for uh, uh, computing it. But actually, we can now identify this with the, uh, with the um, uh, world sheet. And in fact, you can identify Feynman diagrams associated. You can give a Feynman diagram prescription for uh, computing these correlators. And the sum over these correlators, so the lumen marker prescription can be thought of as a sum over Feynman diagrams, which gives rise to the world sheet. And you get the sort of uh, the Strebel differential of this, which is related to the covering map through its Schwarzschild. So very naturally, this Strebel differential, which I pulled out of a mathematical hat as a very natural thing, comes in this problem through a very natural quantity that arises in the computation of the sign diagram, namely the Schwarzschild of the covering map, uh, which is also a quadratic differential and also has very uh, and nice properties and uh, 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 yeah and uh, the, yeah so I mean so we generalize this to also include and, and, and you can actually see in a very nice way the, the Feynman propagator uh, uh, between the position space comes out as the number go to e to the minus area that the number go to area in this treble gauge if you put a world sheet metric associated to this struggle differential. So the struggle differential, as I said, it's, um, it's a quadratic differential. You can consider the telemark, I mean, you can consider this object. This, so this defines a natural metric uh, because you can take the modulus and take DZ, DZ bar. And this, uh, because this was holomorphic, this has uh, uh, this modulus has singularities only at zeros and poles of this original thing. So it's that delta function like localized world sheet metric. And you compute the area associated to this as a kind of a regularized area. As I said, you have these strips. Uh, so they are infinite strips, but you have to regulate them. You regulate them and you get a, and a, you put an infrared regulator on the strips. And that gives you an ultraviolet regulator of the Feynman diagram. So there's a very neat correspondence between these quantities on the world sheet uh, and uh, what you would expect in the space time. So I think I won't have, I don't want to go into all this about the twisters and so on, but let me just conclude by saying. Uh, I think uh, the extreme duality can overhaul our understanding of QFT and quantum gravity and the uh, test cases where you can see this explicitly carried out and in some cases see this tractable world sheet theory, which is a sort of a string bit picture of the world sheet that comes. Uh, and I talked yesterday about uh, as, uh, something for 
ordinary matrix model, I think twist level sheet string theory, the underlying topological strings, uh, I think, uh, enlarge our notion of what uh, well sheet descriptions we can have uh, for this tensionless limit. And I think that's a sort of, as is always the case in physics, the deeper mathematical underpinnings to many of the things that we uncover. I just want to end with a quote from Dirac, which he gave here in Bombay in 1955, much before string theory. So he said, and Dirac spent a lot of time trying to go back to these ideas of Faraday and Maxwell. So he says, one possibility in this direction is to regard an electron as the end of a single Faraday line of force. The electric field in this picture from discrete Faraday lines of force, which are to be treated as physical things like strings. One then has to develop a dynamics for such a string-like structure and quantize it. In such a theory, a bare electron would be inconceivable since one cannot imagine the end of a piece of string without having the string. So, so that's why I think we need strings. So, okay, thank you. Clearly, the string theory started here. <laughs> now, who's uh, thinking about the area action? Yes. But maybe it came from the Giraffe from Horn. Ah, I see. Giraffe spring and sheep there and then. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Any questions from here? Yeah. So, so, so if you look at the string that you have, uh, the world sheet, your four point functions, if I understand right, are concentrated at points in cross ratio space. In, in the tensionless limit, yeah. So any given order in perturbation theory, right? In any given order in perturbation theory, yes, there would be uh, the genus perturbation extension. The genus, yeah. Yeah. correct. And uh, this is, I must just add one caveat that. This is for anything with finite number of, if you wish, the size of the operators. Yeah, finite. Let's keep those finite and work to any given order of perturbation. Now, we expect in any equals for animals, the perturbative series, lambda perturbation theory to be convergent. So even at a small finite, finite radius, finite radius right? So even at a small finite coupling, this picture shouldn't change very much. Yes. So now I was wondering whether we should take that seriously or whether it might be like in your lecture yesterday uh, that there might be a dual description with a more smooth kind of world sheet. Yeah, I, I, I think there would be probably a more smooth kind of world sheet even in this uh, even in this original description when you turn on non-zero coupling because they, what do you do when you turn on non-zero coupling? If you think of it perturbatively, is your essentially pulling down, uh, like when we learn in QSD, you're pulling down the interaction vertex. and But now you integrate that vertex over all uh, positions. I see. Uh, so, uh, so then it's like computing n point function, n plus one point function, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, you, you will have certainly, I think, uh, uh, so in a perturbative expansion, I think there will be uh, so uh, that integral will probably get uh, contributions from uh, specific points, but um, uh, you you will have to sort of sum over uh, 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 all of them. But it may I, I feel the specific points are very physical because it's to do with this um, string bits, and I think this is what the integrability picture also suggests that you have a spin chain. Which, which has so think of it as a uh, as uh, some number of beads on a string, uh, with the beads being rigid I and mean, the uh, rods between the beads being rigid. But each bead can move around in any in in some very freely. So the uh, so the uh, beads that are around. If I have some fixed W number of beats, the number of degrees of freedom of that string-like object is very limited. I, each of the W objects will, but if I make W very large, it becomes, of course, more and more like a continuum string. Uh, but if I take W equals to four, there'll be only sort of four beats and they can move in some ways. So I trace out some shapes, some surfaces. So that's what this localization is. 
<laughs> so, it, it, but when I think you are at finite coupling, uh, uh, this gets somehow smeared out um, because uh, effectively, I think you it can. Uh, 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 it's like in the spin chain picture, but now next to nearest neighbors start interacting and things can start hopping. Uh, and uh, so, so some of my intuition comes from that. And uh, the free theory is the non-interacting bits. But even in the spin chain picture, if we work it, even up to finite coupling, coupling it, if you've got a small operator, it doesn't really look like a continuum string. Correct. Uh, so, it, yeah, but you get some more, you get degrees, uh, more, more degrees of freedom and you will, I, I think that is there. And because you are building up the string from string bits. So yeah. maybe it's like what Abhijit was saying at the beginning, that because of the Ramon Ramon fields, the structure of string perturbation theory changes uh, to make these things more jaggedy. And you recover the continuum only at infinity. Is that your picture? Uh, of a very large operators. Or, or, yeah, or of so VMN like operators. <laughs> or even small operators, but infinite coupling. Because there's yeah. a small body should be. Infinite coupling, yes. Uh, uh, right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, but it's not really Ramon Ramon flux because what we've seen ah, never sure flux. Uh, uh, but yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know how exactly it will go. Uh, yeah. and, but, and, uh, but coming back to your original question of whether it's. Uh, uh, there might be a dual description in which this is just a, uh, th this is a, maybe like a physical gauge. It's like mm -hmm. light cone gauge. You see mm -hmm. uh, things there in light cone gauge, you could always strike things in terms of this rigid uh, string thing. So this may be a certain one sheet gauge, the treble gauge is some kind of a light cone light gauge. <laughs> it has the delta function singularities. So, in a way, it's all because of that. This is a kind of singular gauge. The world sheet, you're putting all the world sheet curvature at very specific points of an interaction of these flat strips. Uh, um, and then there are only finitely many ways of putting the flat strip. It's like in a finite triangulation. And you, the conical defects of conical angles are finite. Uh, and you can only get some finite number of uh, configurations. So that's, I think, like a maybe a physical gauge of some kind. But there might be another gauge in which it might be. So, yeah. So I, 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 I'm open to the thought that there might be another gauge which will be a more continuum like uh, this thing. And this is maybe closer to the spin chain picture or some other such gauge. You know, the gross memory limit is in principle like alpha prime going to infinity because. What you do is to alpha prime k1 square going to infinity, alpha prime k2 square going to infinity. So you, you can actually k1 fixed and then you take all the momentum fixed and take alpha prime. So they, what they did was uh, let's say the k of k1 to the k3 k4, and you have the yes. squares of all of these yes. going to infinity at the same rate. And uh, by, by the dimensionless quantity, that's a prime. Alpha prime case, right? So, so that, you, can, you can think of that. That's why it's that that less limit. Ah, uh -huh. that's right. So I'm saying that in their case, what happened was that just one point in the model. Exactly. Is there was a pattern. Uh, exactly. So that's also very much in the same mm -hmm. spirit. Absolutely. That, in fact, we, scro uh, the, 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 we have also some saddle points in ADS3, uh -huh. which look very much like the gross and they are if you look at the string configuration, they are also from solving a uh, similar sort of log, kind of log of Z minus yes. ZI for electrostatic potential, same electrostatic potential. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I think, yeah, it, it's, uh, this localization, I think, is not, uh, it's not unexpected in some ways. Of... So, Rajesh, sorry. Please. A remedial question. You know, when you take your first course in string theory, at least when I took it, it was taught in the following way that you start with QCD and you observe the rigid trajectory and then you model it in strings. But then you realize even if you start with the open strings, they can always close, become closed and closed strings have a graviton. So you say, forget QCD and do that. And in your case, you're saying, no, take pure blue QCD and it is a closed string theory. 
And what happened to the graviton? Because it's in ADS space and all that. Asymptotically, some ADS geometry, there'll be a stress tensor that uh, that's uh, one there's no, the graviton. There's no pool corresponding to mass space. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, like in the models of ADS QC. I mean, those are models, but I think in the, the, but the basic features would be like, like in that. Uh, 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 so, yeah, there won't be any. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, and and the other fatal thing earlier was that in flat space string scattering amplitudes went like e to the minus s, whereas in any gauge theory they fall off power law. But that uh, Pulsinski and Strassler had a very nice picture of how uh, in ADS you it transmutes effectively the exponentially soft uh, scattering amplitude to a power law scattering amplitude. And essentially coming from the scale factor, the, the radial scale factor. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that, so that it shows that you can how you can reproduce uh, uh, that you need something like that radial direction, and, and that's why the QCD strings, if you think of them as flat uh, strings, and the way all these people who do the effective strings of QCD, they're like fat strings. But that they are fat strings because you are looking at you are projecting out uh, an extra dimension, mm -hmm. uh, and this is sort of just uh, uh, you are integrating out the radial direction and writing an effective theory for this the transverse degrees of freedom, and that will be mm, a sort of uh, that will have I think many of the problems that uh, uh, so it's but can think of it as an effective description but not as a fundamental microscope. Any other questions? Yeah. One quick question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, can you give us about other magnets? For example, the super lactic state, which is the theory of magnetic thermal state. Uh, for the thermal state? Yeah, I, I think uh, for the thermal state, in fact, I think you can do somewhat similar things if you think of it in terms of copies and uh, uh, like uh, the Feynman diagrams. In, uh, I haven't thought in detail about it now, but I remember a long time ago there was this postdoc who did uh, something similar by looking at the this Matsubara copies and uh, trying to reproduce the thermal uh, propagators from the Feynman diagrams with the uh, with these images. Uh, yeah, but uh, I haven't seriously revisited that around uh, this around the other states. Uh, uh, trying to see, in fact, yeah, he wanted to try to see if the Schwarzschild geometry would be sort of. Uh, uh, you can the holonomy, I presume. Uh, right. I presume he took it out. The holonomy, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Hey, I should uh, wrap up.